Chapter 1 The Copycat Bunny Mayor There wasn't a town in the world better than Nestlebrook Cove, the quaint little village that was about to elect me as the new mayor, and I dared anyone to say otherwise. It was easy to see all the ways I could prove naysayers wrong as I drove along our main, okay only, road on the rare, sunshiny, 60-degree February day. It was a delight to see so many people out enjoying the late winter warm spell. Kids were playing safely and joyfully outside, neighbors were checking in on each other, and dogs were chasing balls at the park. What the heck? I screeched my tires to a stop and glanced in my rearview mirror as I received an angry look and hand gesture from the driver behind me. Even that rude response proved how charming and livable our tiny town was. I was clearly in the wrong, but did he pierce the air with a loud, obtrusive honk? Nope. Ignoring the annoyed driver, I slammed my SUV into park in the middle of the street and got out to get a better look at the offending object. Blinking and stunned, my mouth hung open as I gaped at the park bench. The backrest featured a shiny photo of our incumbent mayor with his thick, wavy, movie star hair, a wide smile revealing perfect, uber-white teeth, and, I shook my head in disbelief at the man's audacity, a soft, gray rabbit. How dare he! I was the one with the bunny I loved to pieces. Honey wasn't just a pet to me. She was also my fluffy best friend and confidant. Sure, I had brought her to my official photo shoot for my mayoral candidate photos and chosen an unforgettable portrait that featured us snuggling our faces together. But that hadn't been a gimmick, like this travesty from Michael Snow. The current mayor's sparkling, overly photoshopped eyes, that gorgeous shade of blue didn't exist in real life, glinted at me, practically daring me to call him out on the obvious ploy to steal my bunny mascot idea and the goodwill that went along with it. Glaring at the offensive bench, my teeth gritted together as I read his new campaign slogan. Vote for snow and watch our town grow. Tossing my hands in the air as I stalked back to my car, I yelled towards the sky. That just proves you have no idea what makes our picturesque little town so wonderful. The drivers of the two cars that were weaving around my big SUV, which was blocking the lane, bugged their eyes out in my direction as if I was a lunatic. Deciding they might be registered voters, I swallowed my anger, forced a smile, and waved at them. Every vote counted, especially when I was running against a beloved, for some strange reason, incumbent, who was clearly ready to try every trick in the book, including using a sweet, innocent bunny, to sway voters to his side. Continuing to smile to myself after the cars passed, I realized Michael Snow had only stooped to this fake bunny love photo op because he was worried about his chances of being re-elected. He knew that I had a strong platform and a good handle on the issues. I was coming for his job, and he was officially getting nervous. After climbing back into my SUV, it seemed like kismet when I heard Queen's classic song, We Are the Champions, playing on the radio. I turned up the volume to a very unmayoral level and sang my heart out as I headed towards my house, picturing the gold lettering that would soon be applied to the glass door of my new office in City Hall after I trounced Michael Snow. Hope Montgomery, Mayor. My firm belief in visualizing the outcome I wanted in any situation had helped me manifest my desires more times than I could count, so I wasn't about to stop the beneficial practice now. Besides, my parents had named me Hope, so what choice did I have but to be ever hopeful? When I saw the huge black dog trotting towards me by himself on the sidewalk, I thought about stopping to try to catch him. His wide grin kept him from looking dangerous, despite his massive size. In fact, his gait seemed so purposeful, and he looked so happy, I decided to let it slide. Loose dogs would be my problem after I won the election in May, but for now, they were still Michael Snow's issue. It suddenly dawned on me how many of these oversized, fluffy dogs I'd seen around town lately. There must have been a local litter of them that was all reaching maturity at the same time. It wasn't a breed I had taken note of before, 
But now that they were stomping their giant paws around all over the place, it was impossible not to notice how gorgeous, impressive, and friendly they were. If I didn't love bunnies so much, I might consider making this large breed of dog the town mascot. Shaking my head to clear that thought, I couldn't help but smile as I visualized my sweet honey bunny making appearances and posing for photo ops as the official town rabbit. I was almost more excited about the prospect of securing that honor for her than winning the popular vote in the mayoral election for myself. Almost. When my vehicle drew closer to the prancing black dog, something in its mouth caught my attention. Chuckling as I went slowly by him, I realized that he was so proud of himself because he was carrying his stuffed teddy bear. Now that was cute. Not quite bunny cute, but still pretty adorable. If I had known, at that time, what that wretched beast was actually holding in his gooey mouth, I would have raced after him. Chapter 2 Bunny Chew Toy The panicked expression on Maria's face as she ran wide-eyed out the front door of my house told me instantly that something was very wrong. I'm so sorry, ma'am. I just went inside for a minute. It happened so fast. My normally eloquent pet sitter stammered. What is it, Maria? I tried to get the woman to clarify what had happened, even as I felt my face crumple into a mask of concern and fear. The woman stopped by to check on Honey twice a day and was normally gone long before I got home from work. Today I had sent everyone home and left my campaign headquarters early, to enjoy the unseasonably warm weather for a bit. I went in the house to answer the phone. It was a campaigner for Michael Snow calling to make sure we were registered to vote. The woman's mouth flattened into a thin line after she revealed this tidbit. I rolled my eyes because the information was both annoying that Snow's team had the nerve to call my house looking for votes and unnecessary considering that there was obviously an emergency to be handled. After making a quick mental note to get rid of my superfluous landline, I nodded and encouraged Maria to go on. Taking the hint, Maria said, I took a minute to tell them all the reasons why I'll be voting for you in May instead of the current mayor, who wants to overrun our beautiful town with big businesses and call it progress. While I appreciated the woman's sentiment and vehemence surrounding it, I was growing weary of waiting to see what had happened. Fear iced my veins as I wondered if my sweet honey bunny had been injured. Bringing the woman back to the point, I asked, Maria, is Honey okay? I don't know, the woman wailed, drawing out the last word interminably. I could feel my eyes bugging out in her direction. It was all I could do to keep from screaming at her to make her explain what had happened. But some still rational sliver of my brain knew that wouldn't accomplish anything. The woman's arms flailed around as she spoke. Honey was outside getting some fresh air when I went to answer the phone. When I came back, she was gone. Poof. The word poof raced through my mind over and over as I rushed past her and out to the backyard. Certain that this must be some mistake, I searched every corner of my tiny fenced-in lawn. Shaking my head, unable to comprehend that my sweet little bunny was really gone, I muttered, But the fence is secure. She can't get out. A flash of hope surged through me, and I turned to Maria. Did she sneak past you and back inside the house? I was already running inside to check Honey's normal hangouts when I heard Maria say, No, ma'am. Once I checked her usual spots in the house and came up empty, I flopped down on the sofa. Staring at the wall, I said, She can't jump the fence, and she didn't dig her way out. Where is she? Maybe a big hawk swooped down and stole her. Maria guessed in a decidedly unhelpful manner. I hadn't even thought of that type of possibility, nor did I want to. Shaking my head to clear it of that horrendous mental image, I said, maybe someone stole her. Maria shrugged her shoulders, but I could tell she didn't think that was what had happened. It was tempting to defend the idea, since it was one of the only scenarios I could think of where Honey was still safe, but I didn't have the energy to point out all the reasons why my sweet pet would be the highly sought-after target for a wily bunny napper. I considered how humorous that ridiculous word would sound if we weren't facing this dreadful tragedy. As pathetic as it seemed, I wasn't sure how to go on without my furry best friend. Stealing my resolve, I decided that we had to find her. 
Needing to use the logical side of my brain to work through this, I said to Maria, Okay, we need to find her. She's probably scared half to death and trying to figure out how to get home. I couldn't allow myself to even think about any other alternatives. I certainly didn't want to make something awful manifest from my negativity. Ignoring my fears, I said to Maria, You stay here and make some phone calls to see if anyone we know has seen her. Call my cell phone as soon as you know anything, or if she comes home. Even though I knew that last bit was probably overly optimistic, I couldn't, and didn't want to, keep my namesake at bay. I had to cling to the hope that we would find Honey soon and uninjured. Already stalking out the front door, I yelled back at Marina, I'll start canvassing the neighborhood to see if anyone saw anything. My nosy across-the-street neighbor, Mrs. Bunch, was the most likely person to have seen something. She practically made it her full-time job to peek out her front windows and keep an eye on everything going on in our neighborhood. After marching across the street, I pounded on her door. When the curtain moved, but she didn't answer, I yelled through the closed front door, I know you're in there, Mrs. Bunch. The woman probably assumed I was there to solicit her vote, even though the last time I had mentioned it to her, she spent 45 minutes detailing how wonderful she thought Mayor Snow was, enlisting all the marvelous things he had accomplished since taking office. I'm not here to talk politics, I revealed through the door. Those must have been the magic words because she immediately swung her door open. As soon as she did, I began speaking, not wanting to waste another second. My bunny, Honey, is missing. She disappeared from my backyard. Did you see anything suspicious going on at my house? Hmm. The woman rubbed her wrinkled chin as if in deep thought. I'm trying to remember if I glanced over at your house today. We were both well aware that she did little else besides stare at the houses surrounding hers, but I needed her help so I didn't call her out on the fib. I do think I remember seeing something she hinted rather unhelpfully. When her dramatic pause dragged on, I realized she was enjoying this. Rather than getting angry about her holding up my progress, I made a silent vow to come visit the lonely old woman more often. Giving her the kindest smile I could muster, I said, if you can remember what you saw and share the details with me, I would be most appreciative. Nodding, she pretended like she was fuzzy on the details, even though I knew her mind was sharp as a tack. Hmm. Let's see. I did see an animal head towards the back of your house. It was a big, black, hairy thing, and it stood on its hind legs like a bear as it tried to get over your fence. My legs nearly gave out from under me. That enormous dog I had seen earlier wasn't prancing with a stuffed teddy bear in its mouth. It was carrying honey. Mrs. Bunch continued talking about how she would have called someone if she'd known the animal took honey, but her words barely registered as my mind reeled and I tried not to pass out. Wheeling around, I ran down her porch steps towards the sidewalk. I knew which way that awful dog had gone with my sweet pet, and I intended to track him down. I just prayed it wasn't too late. Swallowing down that thought, I turned back to my neighbor. Did you recognize the dog? Do you know where he lives? The woman's stunned gaze met mine. That enormous beast was a dog? Chapter 3. Meeting the Thief Quickly realizing that Mrs. Bunch wasn't going to be any further help, I thanked her over my shoulder and ran in the direction I'd seen the dog traveling. I stopped a few houses down and began pounding on doors. The answers I received were all similar. Most people had noticed the large dogs that had been slowly taking over our sleepy little town, but no one seemed to know where the one in question belonged. After visiting at least ten houses with no luck, I decided to walk for a while and call for my bunny. Maybe we'd get lucky and the giant dog had released honey. If so, the little puff ball was probably shivering under a shrub somewhere, uncertain how to find her way home. Unfortunately, I'd never trained Honey to come when called, but I felt certain that my pet would recognize my voice and hop my way if she was able to. She was probably as desperate to find her way home as I was to have her back. I was almost past the inviting gray clapboard house with white trim when I heard the barking. The house was right next door to one that had suffered a major fire a few months ago. I had stopped by the burned house several times to see what I could do to help, but the homeowner never seemed to be around. 
The loud, rambunctious barking emanating from the gray house sounded like it was coming from a very large dog. I turned and jogged up to the home's wraparound porch, silently praying that it was the right big dog. I opened the screen door and pounded loudly with my fist on the thick, intricately carved cherry front door. The barking escalated to the point that I began to wonder how many dogs were inside. It sounded like an entire pack of vicious wolves. Suddenly, I wasn't sure whether to hope Honey was inside or to pray that she wasn't. When the door finally swung open, a lovely but dainty woman smiled sheepishly at me as she attempted to hold back an enormous black dog that was determined to rush out the door at me. Sorry, we're still working on his front door manners. She gave me a kind smile as her dog heaved himself at me. Despite her hold on his thick collar and her command of, Rascal, sit! The animal remained determined to get to me. The more she tried to hold him back, the more he lunged. He obviously outweighed the small woman by over 50 pounds, and she was the only thing keeping him from jumping out and knocking me down. I took a wary step back and bugged my eyes out as I waited for the brute to escape her grasp and hurl his massive body in my direction. Quickly realizing that she was losing this battle, the woman looked at me and said, Please come in. I'm sure Rascal will calm down once you're inside. She sounded confident that her dog wouldn't attack me. I did not have that same level of faith. In fact, the last thing I wanted to do right now was step inside the animal's lair, but if Honey was inside, I had to save her. Thinking how much I must love my pet to be willing to do this for the chance of finding her, I nodded nervously and took a tentative step inside the house. The woman tried to pull her dog back so I would have room to walk into their entryway, but the dog was having no part of it. He shoved his wide body into me as soon as I crossed the threshold. Oh, I startled from the impact of his body. The woman beamed like a proud mama down at her enormous baby. To me, she said, he just wants you to pet him. Her voice turned sing-songy when she turned her attention back to the dog. Don't you, Mr. Handsome? The dog leaned his weight onto me, fully trusting that I would support him. Not seeing another option, I stooped down to scratch his back. His fluffy tail flapped slowly back and forth as I stroked his surprisingly soft fur. Evidently deciding that my greeting was sufficient, the animal whirled around and sat down next to his mother, plopping his wide rear end directly on her foot. The woman must have been used to it because she didn't even wince from the pressure despite the fact that she was only wearing a house slipper rather than a more protective shoe. One quick glance down at my light beige dress slacks confirmed that my pants now sported an unsightly layer of black hair from calf to thigh where the dog had leaned on me. Giving me a warm, friendly smile, the lady defended her unruly dog. We are taking Rascal to puppy obedience training classes, but we still have a thing or two to work on. I couldn't believe she had the audacity to call this behemoth a puppy or that she thought they only had a thing or two to work on. But I decided it was not in my best interest to comment on either of those flaws in her logic. My mind was still reeling from the realization that I might not actually be attacked for entering this monster's home when recognition dawned on the woman's face. Her smile widened even further when she said, Miss Montgomery, it is such an honor to have you in our home. My name is Lily, and I think I know exactly why you're here. I followed her gaze to the corner of her living room. The enormous animal resting in the corner resembled a bearskin rug. Upon closer inspection, I realized it wasn't a black bear, but rather what appeared to be an identical twin to the dog plopped on Lily's foot. What made my eyes almost pop out of their sockets was the copper-colored ball of fluff the animal was protectively resting its chin on. I easily recognized that soft fur, which ranged from the color of a shiny new penny to the deep bronze of pennies that had been in circulation for years. Honey? My panicked voice squeaked. Chapter 4 Dogs, Bunnies, and Kitties Oh My My sweet pet gave me a panicked expression as her pink nose wiggled in overdrive from her unsettling perch on the large animal's front paws. My fight-or-flight reaction kicked in as I was overwhelmed, 
first by relief that she was uninjured, and then by fear that she might soon be. The last thing I wanted was to stand by and watch as this big dog made a light snack of my little honey bunny. Not bothering to wait for an invitation to come further inside the home, I ran across the room to save my rabbit. The dog that was holding honey captive rested its giant head on top of my bunny and looked up at me with giant chocolate brown eyes. It was almost as if she was daring me to take away her new chew toy. Rascal decided we were playing a fun new game and ran along with me. Intimidated by the size of Honey's imprisoner, but unwilling to show it, I reached for my bunny. The dog lowered her head further as if she was protecting her new treasure. Unwilling to be shut down so easily, I reached my hands further in, not caring that I was easily within the animal's biting range, and said, You need to let her go. To my shock and dismay, Honey burrowed further into the big animal's furry neck and chest as if she was trying to avoid me. Just as I wondered if rabbits ever suffered from Stockholm Syndrome, I saw the flash of soft gray heading in our direction. I froze as the gorgeous light gray bunny hopped over and settled itself right next to Honey on the dog's outstretched paws. The three cuddled together like a happy little family. The dog gave a great stuttering sigh and moved her massive head to rest it on the floor beside the snuggly bunnies. Rascal circled around a few times before plopping down right next to them. All four appeared to be ready to settle in for a cozy nap. I almost couldn't believe my eyes. Honey appeared to be perfectly content in her giant captor's embrace. I had been thinking recently that perhaps I should get a second bunny to keep Honey company during the day while I was at work and couldn't be with her myself but the sight before me convinced me that she must be more lonely than I ever could have imagined. Evidently, I need to move the task of finding a second rabbit up on my priority list. Lily moved from the doorway to stand beside me. She was smiling down at her dogs as if their decision to steal honey and keep her as their own was the cutest thing she had ever seen. Confirming that, she said, I think Riley has decided your bunny is her new baby. I darted a glare in the woman's direction. Honey was my baby, and I didn't appreciate her insinuation that her dog could take sufficient care of her, especially since Honey seemed to be perfectly content with the situation. Just as I was getting ready to inform her that Honey didn't need a new mom, an angry hiss sounded from the hallway. All eyes moved in the direction of the furious noise, an irate orange tabby cat was puffed up to what I hoped was three times his normal size. He stalked into the room, darted under the coffee table, and glared out at Honey and the Gray Bunny. Oh, stop it, Morty, Lily lightly reprimanded the bitter animal. I felt certain this mean feline would kill us all if given the opportunity, and I didn't want to stick around or take any further chances with my sweet bunny's life. Just as I went to scoop Honey up into my arms, another cat came screeching around the corner. This one was much smaller but otherwise nearly identical to the first. It bounced on all four of its paws as it warily eyed the dogs and bunnies. When it crouched down like it was getting ready to pounce, I shielded Honey with my hands. Ah, Milo's harmless, the woman said before stooping to scratch the orange kitten's pointy ears. To the animal, she said with her lips pooched out, You just think you're tough, don't you, little man? The loud ding-dong of the doorbell startled us all, A tall man emerged from the kitchen saying, I bet I know exactly who that is. He paused on his trek to answer the door as he caught sight of me. Oh, hi. Sharing a secret look with the woman, he said, This should be interesting. I didn't have to wonder for long what he meant, because when he swung the front door open, the man standing on the other side was none other than our town's current, but only until May, Mayor Michael Snow. Chapter 5. The Temporary Mayor Mayor Michael Snow strolled confidently into the house as if he owned the place. He beamed wide smiles at everyone, only faltering slightly when he noticed me on the floor. Lily returned his grin with her own pretty one. Mayor Snow, it's an honor to see you again. Please, I think we're past the point where you can call me Michael. The man's gleaming white teeth made an appearance as he charmed the unsuspecting lady. Turning to shake the man's hand, he said, Van, right? At the homeowner's confirming nod that he'd gotten the name right, the mayor said, 
I didn't think I'd be here again so soon. Yeah, a rascal sometimes has a mind of his own. Van looked sheepish about his dog's complete lack of manners. The mayor chuckled as if having his bunny stolen by a huge dog was utterly amusing. Turning his vivid blue gaze down at me, he said tersely, Montgomery? Snow? I responded just as crisply, even though I couldn't help noticing that his eyes hadn't been photoshopped on that park bench photograph as I had thought. They really were that startling, impossibly bright shade of blue. Darn it. Telling myself they were probably colored contacts was petty, but it made me feel better. I gave him an ornery grin as I silently decided that must be the secret behind his mesmerizing gaze. Sonny, the mayor called out to the gray bunny when his blue eyes traveled down to the snuggling foursome on the floor. I made a scoffing sound in my throat. You named him Sonny the Bunny? I did, the mayor answered unapologetically before asking, Isn't your little angel named Honey the Bunny? He had a point, so I let the topic drop. I hated it that he seemed to be copying me at every turn, but I tried to tell myself that I should look at it as a compliment. He was obviously worried that I would beat him in this election, so he was trying every trick in the book to make sure that didn't happen. As soon as he bent to pick up the gray bunny, I scooped up Honey. Her soft fur was damp from her time in the dog's gooey, wet mouth. I was shocked when my sweet pet began kicking her hind legs trying to escape my grasp. She squirmed and wiggled until I set her gently down on the ground. As soon as she was free, she hopped over and plopped down in her new favorite spot on Riley's paws. The dog moved her head to lightly brush against Honey before closing her eyes, obviously content and ready for a snooze. Sonny didn't attempt to get away from Michael's arms, which made my bunny's betrayal sting even more. I tried not to let the hurt feeling show, but I could feel my cheeks flushing hot pink. Evidently trying to fill the awkward silence and make me feel better, Lily said, All animals love Riley. She mothers them like they're her babies. Since I knew the woman was only trying to help, I shoved down the urge to tell her that Honey already had a mother to baby her. Michael made a move towards the door as he asked them, Same time tomorrow night? The couple chuckled at his attempt at levity. Then the woman quipped, Probably, I guess we should start making an extra place for you at dinner. I listened and squinted my eyes, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. Wait, this has happened before? The mayor nodded in confirmation. Rascal likes to sneak into my house through the doggy door. He sneaks out with Sonny and brings him home to Riley. Don't you, boy? The man leaned down and ruffled the dog's ears. I couldn't believe my ears. This thief wandered around town stealing pet bunnies and bringing them home, and all of these loons thought that was okay? Hoping the homeowners were rational people, I asked them, Don't you think it's your responsibility to keep Rascal on your property? He nearly gave me a heart attack when I figured out he bunny-napped honey. Believe me, we try, Van splayed his hands out. You can take a look around our backyard if you like. It's completely fenced in and reinforced with stakes in the ground, but Rascal is quite determined when he wants something. The woman was nodding her agreement. I think he likes bringing the bunnies as presents for Riley. He's very gentle with them when he carries them, and Riley treats them like fragile, precious babies when he gives them to her. They sounded like proud parents. I shook my head, stunned. But these bunnies are pets. They aren't his to take or hers to mother. I pointed at each of the black dogs as I spoke. For their part, the big animals looked up at me with warm, expressive eyes. It almost seemed like they were trying to tell me not to worry. Deciding that the craziness that abounded in this house was rubbing off on me, I leaned forward once more to pick up Honey. She squirmed, but I clamped her in my embrace and turned towards the door. It was time for us to get out of here, before Honey got any more attached to her captors. I made a break for the front door, intending to make a quick exit. Van said, We'd like to have you both over for dinner to apologize for our little bunny thief's behavior. I couldn't believe he had referred to Rascal as little, but I decided not to linger or point out the obvious. Van leaned down and used his pointer finger to move Rascal's lower lip like the dog was talking. I'm sorry for stealing Honey and Sonny, but I've always wanted my very own bunny wabbits. Lily and Michael both chuckled as if Van's loony pretend dog voice was the funniest thing they had seen all week. I tried to smile and look amused, but I really just wanted to get out of this nut house. 
Van continued his ventriloquism act with the dog. Will you please come to dinner with us? My mama makes the best lasagna when we have company over, and she lets me and Riley look out the dish afterwards. I couldn't help but wonder how well they washed that dish after letting their dogs lick it clean. Trying not to grimace, I turned to give the anxiously awaiting couple my answer. My intention was to say I was busy, no matter when they wanted this dinner party to happen, until I heard Michael say enthusiastically, That sounds fantastic. When? How about Thursday? Van asked. Works for me, Michael answered. All eyes veered in my direction. The last thing I wanted was to spend any more time with these people or their obnoxious pets. But I couldn't let Michael Snow spend an entire evening dazzling them and earning their votes. They might only be two people, but it was going to be a tight race where every single vote mattered. I felt certain Michael would win them over if I wasn't here to present my case. Sure, Thursday sounds great. I tried to insert some enthusiasm into my smile, even though I didn't feel it. It's a date then, Lily smiled and waved as Michael and I made our exits. As an afterthought, she added, Bring the bunnies. Once the door was safely closed behind us, we parted ways without a further word. I scurried down the sidewalk with Honey tucked safely in my arms. Michael turned the other direction to head towards his home. Already dreading Thursday evening, I shook my head over my own inability to say no. I didn't even have their phone number to call and make an excuse not to go. Declining their invitation would require another visit to their door. If I was going to do that, I might as well suffer through a meal with them and try to sway their votes in my direction. I stopped in my tracks when I realized what the date would be on Thursday. Honey startled in my arms when the annoyed, garbled sound emerged from deep in my throat. Arg! I was going to have Valentine's Day dinner with Mayor Michael Snow. I couldn't think of a worse way to endure an already depressing holiday. Chapter 6 Worst Holiday Ever I'd been told since I was a child that girls were supposed to like romance, love, and all of the other mushy things that Valentine's Day represented. I, however, was a firm believer that it was the worst holiday ever. Perhaps my view was skewed by the fact that I'd never enjoyed a February 14th with a sweetheart who adored me, but I seriously doubted if my opinion on the blasted holiday would ever change. This particular Valentine's Day was sure to be especially horrid, because I was spending it with people I didn't like and their unruly pets. I wasn't sure how I got myself into this mess or how to eke my way out of it. As much as I didn't want to go to this dinner party, I felt obligated to at least make an appearance. It would be rude to back out at this point. Besides, my competitive spirit wouldn't allow me to let the current mayor win their votes. I had to show up and make my voice heard. In a political race as close as ours, this strange couple's votes could make a difference so I wasn't about to just give them to Michael Snow. I found myself walking slowly on the way to Lily and Donovan's house. I would have much rather spent my Valentine's evening snuggled on the couch with my sweet, cuddly honey bunny, watching a movie and eating takeout, than debating with Mayor Michael Snow. But May's election day was too close to let my efforts stall out now. Honey squirmed in my arms as we approached the gray clapboard home of the giant dogs that liked to bunny nap her. I wondered, for the thousandth time, if it was a mistake to bring her back to their lair. I didn't want to traumatize my sweet pet in any way, but I sensed that she liked it here with these crazy people and their misbehaving animals. Loud barking announced our arrival before I had a chance to knock on the front door. The thick cherry wood door swung open just as I raised my fist. Our town's very own temporary mayor himself was standing inside to greet me. I had been hoping to arrive before Mayor Snow, but he had beaten me to it, and he appeared to have already made himself at home. He blasted me with one of his signature dashing, brilliant, and most likely fake smiles, as he said, Great! You're here! Come on in! It wasn't lost on me that he was treating me as if I was the guest at this meal, even though we were both guests. He had already managed to steal the home court advantage before our evening even started. I shook my head over his slick charm. This man was a formidable opponent, but he would soon find out. So was I. My attention was stolen as the huge dog shoved his body forcefully into my legs. Since he was silently demanding a greeting, I patted his soft head, which was even with my hip, and said, 
Hi, rascal. Seeming pleased with that, he plopped his butt down on the ground and leaned against me. Having learned my lesson with his profuse shedding from my previous visit to this house, I had planned ahead and worn black dress pants tonight, despite Honey's copper-colored fur. Van arrived in the entryway and offered to take the coat I'd worn since the balmy weather from a few days ago had given way to a more typical February chill in the air. I reluctantly placed Honey down on the floor. She happily hopped off to play with the other animals. Mayor Snow politely helped me shuck my black wool pea coat and handed it to Van to hang up. When Van held a paper towel he had brought with him from the kitchen out in my direction, I wasn't sure what his intention was. I accepted it, but lifted one of my eyebrows in a questioning gaze. He indicated my pants leg. Glancing down, I let out a garbled, disgusted sound before my brain had a chance to contain it. Yeah, Roscoe likes to slime people. Van smiled as if it was perfectly normal to get drooled on upon entering someone's home. Charming, I replied under my breath as I swiped the goo off my pants with the paper towel. The mayor evidently heard my uncensored, sarcastic reaction because he chuckled before quickly catching himself and turning towards the kitchen to say loudly, Lily, darling, the smells coming out of your oven are absolutely mouth-watering. Following the men further into the house, I had to admit he was right. Wow, it does smell good. Smoothly handing me a glass of red wine, Lily smiled and said, It needs to bake a few more minutes. Let's chat in the living room until it's ready. I was a very rare drinker, but I didn't want to seem like a stick in the mud, especially since Michael Snow picked up his own wine glass from the counter and followed Lily into the homey living room. A crackling fire was burning in the stone fireplace, giving the room a warm, romantic glow. It would have been the perfect place to curl up with a good book, if Honey and I were the only ones here since my nemesis, our loony hosts, and their obnoxious pets were all present, a quiet evening of reading wasn't an option. I jumped when I noticed the couple tiptoeing down the hallway towards us. It was obvious by the others' pleasant reactions that the newcomers weren't intruders. I felt at a disadvantage again when Michael Snow asked, Did you get her to sleep? We did, the woman beamed a smile at him before turning to me. Hi, I'm Julia, Van's cousin, and this is Derek. We're sneaking around like thieves in the night because we just got our baby girl to nod off, and we're really looking forward to a dinner with actual adult conversation that doesn't revolve around sleep schedules and diaper changes. Julia had the tired eyes of a new mom, but her friendly demeanor was contagious. Hope Montgomery, I returned her smile and added, I'm so happy to be included in your big evening out. The oven's timer began buzzing and Lily ran to the kitchen to remove the lasagna. Van followed her, leaving Michael and I to chat with the groggy-eyed parents. We quickly learned that Derek was a firefighter. I could see by the gleam in Michael's bright blue gaze that he knew as well as I did that impressing the handsome young man might help sway the critical vote of the local firefighters' union. Michael was shameless in his efforts to point out all the ways the mayor's office had already helped the local division of the IAFF. I responded to each of the incumbent's points with valid ways that I planned to make his efforts better. When Derek bugged his eyes out at Julia, I could tell that our one-upmanship, as we vied for his vote, was making him uncomfortable. When Lily called out that dinner was ready, the fireman practically sprang out of his chair to bolt into the dining room. Someone's hungry, Lily teased Derek with a good-natured smile as he took a seat at the table. Once the rest of us were seated, Lily and Van brought the heaping dinner plates loaded with steaming rectangles of lasagna. Everyone made appropriate comments about how delicious it looked and smelled. When our hosts took their seats, we passed the salad and breadsticks around the table before digging into the marvelous meal. Proving that he wasn't as sensitive as I was to their discomfort with political talk, the mayor said, Did you all notice my new park bench advertisements? I figured the investment in sprucing up the seats was better than littering Nestlebrook Cove with tacky signs. The way he wrinkled his nose in distaste made it obvious that he was making an intentional dig at the signs I had recently had printed to post in the yards of agreeable homeowners. I thought that was your face, but the pigeon droppings on your nose made it difficult to be certain, I told him, giving him a fake smile as I indicated my own nose. Pretending like it had just occurred to me, I added, I also couldn't help but notice that you used your pet bunny in the photograph. Where did you come up with that ingenious idea? I kept my tone light and continued to smile, despite the fact that I was practically daring him to admit that he had stolen the bunny idea from me. Brilliant, wasn't it? 
he beamed at me, showing enough white teeth to be a cartoon shark. Lily smoothly brought the conversation out of that dangerous territory by asking nervously, Does everything taste okay? We all murmured about how delicious the food was. When Van asked about the mayor's new advertising slogan, it was obvious by his startled grunt when Lily kicked him under the table. Glad that Van had brought it up, I jumped at my chance to talk with Mayor Snow about this outside of an official debate. Actually, your new slogan about how the town will grow with snow concerns me a great deal. One of the many fantastic things about Nestlebrook Cove is how quaint and small it is. Aren't you worried about big businesses coming in and obliterating our town's natural charm? Not at all, Michael puffed out. If we're not growing, we're stagnating, or worse, declining. As usual, the mayor was oversimplifying the issues at hand. But we need the right kind of growth that will benefit our current citizens, not tax-incentivized big businesses that will change the face of our local economy, forcing small businesses to close in their wake. If you're suggesting that we should turn our backs on thriving companies that will by their very existence bring jobs, investment, and prosperity to our local community, then I think you misunderstand the basic tenet of what the mayor's office does. My cheeks flared hot at his condescending statement. Oh, I understand that the mayor's office is supposed to do what is in the best interest of the townspeople, the ones who live and work here now, not overpaid corporate bigwigs looking to stuff their own pockets. I knew my response was overly aggressive for a civilized dinner party, but this man grated on my nerves like no other. The fact that he was blinking those blue stunners at me like I was the most amusing person he had ever met only served to make me glare at him with more hostility. Our hosts and their two non-mayoral candidate guests shifted uncomfortably in their seats. It was obvious that Michael and I had taken what was supposed to be a friendly, fun evening and turned it into an awkward, tense ordeal. Seeming unaffected by the tension around us, Michael kept his eyes trained on me. You know what you need? Steam was practically bursting from my ears as I narrowed my gaze at him. I suppose you're going to tell me. I was surprised by his lighthearted answer. I had been expecting something much more scathing than his suggestion that I create a catchy slogan. We'll even help you think of one, he offered jovially as he looked to the others for backup. How about, don't be a dope, vote for hope. I sincerely doubted that he had come up with that off the top of his head. It wasn't anything that I would ever consider using, but it was silly enough to provide some much-needed comedic relief in the room. Van tried his hand at slogan suggesting and failed miserably. Vote for Hope. She likes soap. We all groaned and laughed at his silly contribution. Julia admitted, I think Derek and I are too tired to think of anything that rhymes. Sleep deprivation is messing with our brains. I have one, Lily announced. Her eyes were sparkling with a trace of mischief when she said, Be like the Pope and vote for hope. Brilliant, Van weighed in as we all chuckled at her preposterous idea. Having fun despite myself, I shook my head at them. I didn't realize I was in the midst of such helpful political advisors. Indeed, Michael nodded his head, grinning at me. So, which slogan are you going with? It dawned on me then what true charisma he had. The way his eyes bored into me made me feel like my opinion was the only one that mattered to him. I knew that couldn't be the case, but that didn't stop his mesmerizing gaze from making my breath hitch. Forcing myself to look away, I realized that the others were all looking expectantly at me. Wanting to play along, I said, I think I'll go with vote for hope so she doesn't mope. The table erupted with delighted cheers over my fake new motto. Our merriment only died down when we heard the furious caterwauling coming from the living room. My eyes popped wide open as fear iced my veins. I couldn't move fast enough to see if the angry cat was getting ready to attack my sweet bunny. Before I could get my chair scooted back from the table and run to the living room, I heard the thunderous stampede of paws. I stood frozen in panic as I watched the two bunnies hop furiously in our direction. Their eyes were frantic and filled with fear for their lives. Hot on their cotton tails was an angry orange cat, screeching and yowling as if his tail was on fire. After him came a jumbo-sized black dog, barreling after the trio faster than his size should allow. There was only the briefest of moments to absorb that they were all headed directly towards me. My instinct was to jump out of the way, but I had to do what I could to save my beloved pet rabbit. 
It was as if the room suddenly began moving in slow motion, even though it seemed like it happened in the blink of an eye. I bent down to scoop up my frantic bunny as she bounded in my direction. The mayor's gray bunny, Sonny, lobbed himself into my arms, too. The furious orange tabby hurled himself directly at us, claws extended and hissing. I felt the mayor's arm wrap around us from behind as his large hand shielded us from the angry cat's attack. The giant dog was already in midair when I saw him headed for a collision with us. The whites around his brown eyes were visible as if he realized too late that his leap at us might have been an enormous mistake. I tightened my grip on Honey and Sunny, the mayor solidified his embrace around me, and we all prepared for impact as the enormous dog flew through the air towards us. Chapter 7 The Pile-Up and Aftermath Oomph! The sound erupted from both me and Michael, and possibly even the gigantic dog, as we landed. The fall backwards winded and startled me, but Michael's body broke my fall. Miraculously, the huge dog's paws stretched out around us. Rascal's body was resting on us, but at least he wasn't standing on top of us with his full weight bearing down. I felt like the middle of a big, squishy sandwich, but my main concern was for the bunnies and Michael. Having a nearly 200-pound canine land on the four of us was bound to have injured someone. Rascal was the first to extricate himself from the pileup. He stood next to us and shook his body as if he was trying to reorient and make sure all of his body parts still worked after the significant jarring. The bunnies were the next to gather their wits. They both squirmed out of my too tight grasp and hopped away, appearing unscathed. When I went to move, I felt Michael's hands on my lower back as he gave me a supportive boost to help me stand up. Once I was on my feet, I turned around to offer him a hand. He gladly accepted it. After he stood, I was delighted to see that he had landed on a bean bag. Indicating the now burst hassock with my foot, I said, Lucky that was there to break our fall. Van was already making his way around the table to check on us. I saw what was going to happen and tossed it under you just before the crash landing. Our hero! Lily gave him googly eyes from her spot at the table. Concern hooded her gaze when she turned to address Michael and me. Are you two okay? That was quite a collision. Michael politely waited for me to answer. After rolling my shoulders and testing my legs, I said, I seem to be fine since Michael caught us. Proving that he wasn't as much of a glory seeker as I would have thought, he said humbly, Anyone else would have done the same thing. It was tempting to point out that there were several other people at this table, including one who runs inside burning buildings on purpose, but none of them had the instinct to lunge and catch me as I fell. I found myself charmed by the chivalrous gesture, despite my aversion to the man who made it. When he turned and saw the mess of styrofoam beans that were strewn across the floor, he said to Lily, If you'll bring me a trash bag, I'll be happy to clean up this mess. A smaller version of the cat that had chased our bunnies chose that moment to pounce into the pile of foam peanuts. The mess quickly grew and the cat's fur was soon covered in the staticky pieces. Everyone, except Michael and I, burst out with laughter over the spreading mess as the bunnies hopped over and joined in the static cling party. I tried to scoop up Honey to rescue her from the mess, but she was having no part of that. She kicked her hind feet and demanded to be allowed to play in the pile with the others. I was concerned that she might try to eat one of the pieces and choke, but Van assured me that he wouldn't let that happen. Still uncertain if I should trust him, I gave him a wary look. I'm a vet technician. I work with animals for a living. He seemed confident in his skills, but I wasn't willing to take any chances with Honey's safety. Evidently sensing my hesitancy, Michael asked the man, What are you going to do if they try to eat it, bunny CPR? Even though Michael's question had been asked with more than a hint of sarcasm, Van answered him with utter sincerity. Absolutely. If any of the animals needed it, I would gladly perform CPR on them. I had never thought about such a thing before. 
the idea of someone giving my bunny mouth-to-mouth life-saving breaths was so heartwarming, sweet, and oddly funny. I couldn't stop the inappropriate laughter that bubbled up as I pictured it in my mind. The others stared at me as I held my hand over my mouth and tried, unsuccessfully, to stop giggling. Michael Snow's wide smile spread across his face, and he began chuckling with me. Soon, everyone was laughing. The cat and bunnies pounced in the ever-growing mess of foam peanuts as if they were the greatest toys in the world. They were having so much fun that I decided to stop worrying for a bit. I was confident that Van would jump in if any of them needed medical assistance. Never one to be outdone, Rascal came to investigate what the other animals were doing. After sniffing a few of the white pellets, he stretched out right in the middle of them and began rolling on his back with all four legs in the air. Rascal, what are you doing? Lily's tone sounded exasperated, but the amused look on her face hinted otherwise. The oversized dog stood up and blinked at her with loving brown eyes. His entire back was dotted with white pieces of packing material. He looks like a reverse Dalmatian, Julia said through her giggles. Crossed with an elephant, Derek's deep voice quipped. Hey, he's not that big. Lily glared at him and lightly tossed a breadstick in his direction, which he easily batted away. Almost, Julia quickly weighed in to defend her fireman. Michael gallantly stood behind my chair at the table and pushed it in for me. Once I was settled, he took his own seat before saying, You know, this house is a little bit crazy. But a whole lot of fun, I added, truly enjoying myself with these oddballs. I'm starving. Michael revealed as he picked up his fork and prepared to dig into his meal. Yeah, about that, Lily grimaced. Morty avoided the pile up on the floor by jumping up and skittering across the table. He stepped on several of our plates and directly in the salad bowl on his way through. Michael's expression took an immediate downturn as he set down his fork without taking a bite. He was only quiet for a moment before suggesting, Shall we order pizzas then? We all murmured our agreement, and our wild, crazy, and fun evening was suddenly back on track. Chapter 8. Striking a Deal We scarfed down the hot pizzas like starving people. The animals finally settled down, so the humans found comfy, fireside spots to relax while we chatted in the living room. When Michael offered to help clean up the lasagna dishes from earlier, I practically gagged. The man seemed to have a knack for saying the right thing at the right time. It was charming and infuriating. Lily and Van politely declined his offer, claiming that they enjoyed working in the kitchen together and that they'd do the cleanup after we left. I couldn't help but smile when I saw the two big black dogs sprawled out in front of the door. Both bunnies were snuggled up with them. Someone was snoring loudly. Morty hadn't returned after skittering away, and Milo had disappeared after the foam peanut party. The cats were most likely planning the logistics of their next attack, or napping to rest up for it. For the time being, all was peaceful in the full house, except for the bickering that Michael and I couldn't seem to control. Stricter signage zoning requirements would keep our town from being overrun by companies trying to outdo each other with bigger and more obnoxious signs than neighboring businesses. I said vehemently, not quite able to believe that he was even arguing with me on this seemingly obvious issue. Are you insinuating that the huge, carved lumberjack sign outside of Timbers should be zoned out of existence? His eyes sparkled as he challenged me. It was obvious that he was enjoying this as much as I was. Certain exceptions could be grandfathered in, I said primly, knowing that the three-story high giant was a town landmark. People would riot if we even suggested tearing it down. Oh, so you get to pick and choose who has to follow the rules and who doesn't? He nodded as if he understood my stance. No, but common sense should always prevail over sweeping rules and regulations, I countered. Agreed. He smiled at me, and I couldn't help but smile back. Van dramatically placed his hand over his heart as if he was having palpitations. What was that? Did you two just agree on something? I can't believe this momentous occasion happened in my home. We all chuckled at the silly man's over-the-top reaction. Splaying his hands, Michael said, 
I think we can agree on something else, too. He let the dramatic pause linger as we all wondered what he was going to say. I couldn't imagine anything else that he and I agreed on, so I was stunned when he finally said, We would both be better off working together than we are when we're against each other at every turn. My eyebrows snapped together as I wondered what he was hinting at. The two of us working on the same team would be a disaster of epic proportions because we would bicker over every little detail. Boring that bright blue, unwavering gaze in my direction, Michael said, Hope Montgomery, I would like for you to be my deputy mayor. Blinking furiously, I tried to comprehend the gall of this man. It was starting to sound like he wanted me to give up on my own campaign for mayor of this great town and accept a post as second in command to him. Seeming insensitive to my abhorrence of this colossally bad idea, he went on touting its praises. You challenge me, Hope. You make me think about things in a different way. We could provide our own checks and balances system from inside the mayoral office. I couldn't believe he was serious. The only way this crazy idea of his made any sense was when I realized he was scared. He was afraid I was going to win this race, so he was offering me a consolation prize and hoping I would settle for less than I deserve. Surprising us all, I squared off with him and quirked a brow in his direction. My voice sounded deep and gravelly when I spoke, and the others in the room hung on my every word, especially Michael Snow. Tell you what, I'll accept your offer. His smug expression wasn't anything less than I had expected. Anticipation lit up his face when I lifted up my pointer finger and said, On one condition. Name it, Michael said. His eyelids were lowered, practically daring me. If, and when, I win this election, you'll be my deputy mayor, I challenged him. He took only a second to think it over before agreeing to my terms. That sounds fair. We shook hands on it as the others chimed their glasses together in cheers to our pact. I wondered if I had just made the biggest mistake of my life. May was coming, and no matter how the election results turned out, I would be spending every day working with my nemesis. Chapter 9. Best Holiday Ever We played some rowdy and hilarious rounds of the game Five Second Rule, I was surprised to discover how hard it is to come up with three items in a category within five seconds. When I yelled out root beer as my third chewing gum flavor just before the last of the sand in the hourglass timer ran out, we all laughed. Michael challenged me, but my internet search on my phone found a brand of gum that had a root beer float flavor. I'm not sure why I said that, but it counts. I grinned as I presented my screen for Michael's inspection. You win, he admitted as he stood to retrieve our coats. As he helped me put mine on, I realized that I had enjoyed myself at this wild house much more than I had ever imagined I could. We made plans for the six of us to get together next weekend, and I found myself truly looking forward to it. Feeling ornery as I bent to gently scoop up my sleeping bunny, I said, Let's go out to eat next time, without our unruly pets. That's probably smart, Julia agreed before saying that they would splurge for a babysitter. Michael insisted on walking me safely home. I appreciated the chivalrous gesture, even though I made a lame joke about Honey being a protective attack bunny. We both snuggled our bunnies close to us for extra warmth against the brisk night air as we walked. Honey was still sporting a few stubborn packing peanuts, but I didn't care if they transferred to me. Not wanting the lighthearted banter to end, I smiled up at the handsome man beside me and said, I've never had a deputy mayor walk me home before. After a good-natured chuckle, Michael said, Well, soon you'll be a deputy mayor, so you'll have one with you everywhere you go. I smiled to myself over our gentle ribbing of each other. It was fun having an opponent who could take whatever goading I dished out in his direction and hand it right back to me without getting bitter about it. All too soon, we reached the front door of my house. Some mysterious, confusing side of me wasn't ready to say goodbye to Michael. He seemed reluctant to leave as well. For the first time all night, he looked down at his shoes, seeming uncharacteristically awkward. 
I have a confession to make. Oh, I encouraged him to go on when he let the silence linger. I had an ulterior motive for asking you to be my deputy mayor. Just when I thought this man's motives might be pure, he was getting ready to prove otherwise. I steeled my resolve as I waited for him to admit what he was truly up to. When he finally spoke, his words left me stunned. I like spending time with you, and I want more of it. You challenge me and make me a more critical thinker. I'm confident that we'll make wiser choices for the betterment of our entire town if we work together. No matter if you're working for me or if I'm working for you. My eyelashes fluttered as I tried to comprehend his marvelous words. I shook my head as I tried to make sense of his admission. But we don't get along. We fight at each and every turn. I know. His eyes glimmered as he spoke. That's what makes us so great. We bring different opinions to the table, and we each have strong arguments to back them up. Together, we'll represent all of our constituents' interests and do what's best for us all. I'm sure I'll win some battles, and you'll win others, but if we work together as a team, we'll all win the war. It was crazy and outlandish, but something about his vision of the future with us as bickering teammates filled me with hope. I could easily envision all of the great things we could accomplish if we set our differences aside. There is one other thing. Michael ran his hand along the back of his neck. It was obvious that he was uncomfortable saying whatever was coming next. Quiet dread rose up in me as I waited for him to drop the other shoe. I had been afraid his optimistic version of our future as teammates might have been too far-fetched. When he finally said the words, They were so quiet I had to ask him to repeat them. I said that I've been wanting to kiss you all night. Oh, that's what I thought you said. I bugged my eyes out as I stared at the ground and tried to assimilate this new knowledge with the Michael Snow I thought I knew and detested. I licked my lips nervously as I wondered if he might act on his words. It dawned on me then that I wanted him to. I had never before considered a relationship with the man I was campaigning against but now that the idea had taken root, it was quickly blooming in my mind. Dashing my hopes, he said, I shouldn't have said that. I haven't been wanting to kiss you all night. Oh. I nodded and tried not to reveal on my face the strange surge of disappointment that nearly bowled me over. I should have said that I've been wanting to kiss you for months. Oh. I couldn't formulate the words to express my surprised feelings, so I acted instead. Tipping up on the balls of my feet, I tilted my face up and lightly brushed my lips against Michael's. I've seen all the cheesy movies where the heroine bends her leg at the knee and is swept away by the magic of her first kiss with the man of her dreams. I know these derivative scenes are hogwash. Dreamy, perfect moments that change our lives in an instant simply don't happen in real life. Except... I'll be dipped in cinnamon butter if my blasted foot didn't pop up off the ground behind me as if it had a mind of its own. We must have looked like characters from a scene in a silly rom-com as I shivered in delight from the tingle-inducing pleasure of Michael's soft lips pressing against mine for the first time. As we tenderly explored each other's mouths, I couldn't keep the hope at bay that this might be the first of many marvelous kisses from our town's current mayor. Rival or not, This man knew how to kiss. Our bunnies wiggled together as we each clasped them against our chests between us. When we finally broke the kiss, I immediately missed the feeling of his lips against mine. Forget chocolate peanut butter ice cream. This man's kisses were destined to be my new constant craving. Looking down at our pets, Michael said, It looks like our bunnies are already rather attached to each other. One glance down at Honey's soft head snuggled happily against Sonny's was all it took to see that these two were completely enamored with each other. I beamed down at them, thrilled to have found my sweet pet a loving companion. Bringing my gaze back up to Michael, I was delighted to discover him grinning down at me like I was a voter opinion poll proclaiming him to be the most beloved candidate in Nestlebrook Cove's history. It looks to me like we better spend more time together. For the bunnies, of course. He winked at me to make doubly sure I knew he was teasing. 
Anything for the bunnies, I happily agreed before reluctantly pulling back, telling Michael goodnight, and going inside. After closing the door and leaning back on it, I looked down at Honey, who was still safely ensconced in my arms. Well, Honey, we might need to change our opinion about how awful Valentine's Day is. I'm starting to think it might just be the best holiday ever. I heard that. Michael startled me when he yelled through the closed front door. I held my palm over my mouth, smiling from ear to ear when he added, And I wholeheartedly agree. Chapter 10 Election Day Our shared campaign headquarters was buzzing with anticipation. In the months since our first official date in February, Michael and I had worked together to bring our campaigns to the next level of both healthy competition and unprecedented collaboration. It was the first time in our town's history that opposing candidates had worked together for the greater good. Our campaign managers and staunchest supporters had initially been skeptical, but our shared conviction and enthusiasm had won over nearly everyone. A yellow ribbon ran through the middle of the room, we had both measured to agree on its precise location. Although the room was divided, Michael and I often found excuses to meet in the middle and had even been caught sneaking a kiss or two over the boundary line. Honey and Sunny came to work with us each day and were free to roam the building. We had worked hard to get them both litter box trained so they didn't cause any messes. Their presence encouraged a relaxed, fun, and happy environment that even the non-animal lovers among us appreciated. The sign on the exterior doors let visitors know to not let the bunnies out. Even though I didn't think they would even try to leave, everyone was very conscientious about it and super excited to meet our town's dual mascots. Our sweet pets were getting ready to become even more famous because our good friends Derek and Julia had decided to change their next children's book from being about a lucky ducky to being focused on two political funny bunnies. Julia confided in me that the book was being dedicated to Honey and Sunny. I couldn't wait to get my signed advance copy of it. It was sure to be a bestseller. How could it not be with two such adorable, floppy-eared subjects? For their part, the bunnies didn't seem to care about their fame. They went about their lives as usual, completely ignoring the dividing line in the room and effortlessly bridging the gap between our two sides. They made the rounds visiting everyone without prejudice regarding the humans' political beliefs, but they spent most of their time snuggled and sleeping on one of their cushioned beds on the floor. Michael and I both liked to joke that we had to get along, no matter how the election results turned out, for the bunny's sakes. The stakes felt as high as if human children were involved, we weren't willing to rip our beloved pets from their counterparts. One of the things that impressed me most about Michael was his sincere love for Sonny. My shoulders sagged with relief when I realized my initial fear that he had just adopted the gray bunny as a way to copy me was completely unfounded. The man was almost as enamored with his pet as I was with mine. Some people might consider our bunnies to be spoiled, but they had turned into our constant companions and confidants. If anyone deserved an occasional extra treat or special excursion, it was our lovable puffballs. Finding a stray packing peanut around my house now and then was a small price to pay for such a wonderful friend. Besides, I couldn't even imagine how many of those static-filled nuisances Van and Lily were still dealing with. This election had turned into the closest in recent history. Voter polls showed me pulling slightly ahead in the morning, but throughout the day Michael's numbers approached and passed mine. It was getting late, and we were neck and neck. On the local news, which we were broadcasting on a large screen in the front of the room, they had spent the last hour proclaiming our mayoral race too close to call. When the female newscaster teased that they had preliminary results from our district that she would announce after a short break from the show's sponsors, a hush fell over the room. We all waited with bated breath to see if our hard work had paid off with a win. Michael and I found each other and held hands over the yellow ribbon. When he squeezed my fingers reassuringly, I realized that as much as I wanted the win, I didn't want to see him lose. Proving that he was on a similar page, 
Michael turned, and his gorgeous blue eyes drilled into mine as he said loud enough for everyone else in the room to hear. I never thought I'd say this, but I don't even care how this election turns out. We're both terrific candidates. Our teams both worked hard and should be proud for running solid, clean campaigns. Facing him over the ribbon, I nodded my agreement with his assessment. It vaguely registered with me that the newscaster was back on the big screen, but my focus was on Michael as he reached into the pocket of his navy blazer and retrieved a velvet ring box. The room was silent and all eyes were trained on us as he kneeled down on one knee. Someone moved forward and cut the yellow ribbon so that it fell to the ground, eliminating the line between our sides. I heard the newswoman say, And the results are in from the closest mayoral race in recent history. My entire focus was stolen by Michael when he said, Hope Montgomery, will you please do me the honor of becoming my equal partner and wife as we share the rest of our lives together, fighting all day and making up all night? I didn't hear which way the election went, and I didn't care. All that mattered in that moment was that the love of my life wanted to marry me. Yes! I squealed and lunged into his arms. The entire room erupted with cheers of excitement and congratulations. Michael picked me up and spun me in a circle. Near my ear, he whispered huskily, We both win. Did you miss the first two delightful romances in the pet set? Curl up with goofy newfies and itty bitty kitties today. If you've already snuggled with the pet set, join the sweet romantic adventures of Star, the lovable golden retriever who brings her people together in guarding grace.